Are we live, Atlian? We are live. We are live, and it is story time! <laughs> Believe it or not, here we are after over, oh gosh, how long has it been? 14, 16 months we haven't been here at Twisted Horn Beat and Cider, and we're here live and in person once again. We're so happy to be here at Twisted Horn. We've been happy. Uh, third Thursday storytelling with Twisted Horn here for, oh, for a very long time. We carried it on even during the pandemic. Uh, we were doing Zoom Live just for the folks just like you on Zoom right now. And now we have the live audience right here. So everybody let the Zoom folks hear you. Yeah! All right, well, here we are, third Thursday, Twisted Horn. We are uh, celebrating as we do every September with the Twisted Horn, the beginning of Vista Viking Festival. No! Yeah. Yeah. Now the festival will not be in person again this year. We're going to be doing it online. Uh, both folks on Zoom, remember we're going to be up, uh, with Vista Viking Festival. We're going to do some uh, highlights from tonight's program, um, and it's going to be a whole lot of fun. Uh, so I wanted to say uh, I've got the, several hats on. I've got my Viking Festival hat on, my Storytellers of San Diego hat on, and we're having a night of skull shit. We All right, so where was oh skull shit? Skull shit, yes. Skulls were uh, the Norse society was old Norse society was kind of preliterate. We had runes and we had uh, ways to keep accounting and write little notes and and eulogies and such, but. Full books. No, they didn't have those. So they had skulls. They would carry um, all the knowledge and the wisdom and the cultural history of, of the Norse peoples. And uh, they would sing, they would tell poems, and they would tell stories. So we're going to open up our program here for Ready With Sound. Are we ready with sound? We think so. All right, we're ready with sound. So we're going to open up tonight with one of the five members of the Vista Viking Festival Part of our Team Norwegian Fish Club Odin, Vale, is going to come and open up our program the table next to you. The Loberetto. All right, Vale, our first teller of the night. Here you go, sir. Welcome on. All our Vikings. Welcome. I want to thank uh, Twisted Horn once again for hosting us. How wonderful. Glad uh, to have you back. Uh, splendid, splendid. Thank you, Vince, too wherever you may be. Um, so now, shall we open with a, a, a brief score? And yes. then I will, uh, I have a little poem for you. So the, the first one is a rising and falling scale. And does everyone have a toasting beverage? Okay. So it's a, it's a scale that goes la 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 la, la 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 la. And so what you're gonna do is go, score, 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 score. And then at the end we give it a big, Viking cheer school, and then we drink, okay? So, are you ready? Yes. Ready, here we go. Skull, 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 skull. Skull, 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 skull. Skull! Now you drink. That is right, Dave. In the Viking realm, I noticed Kvasir is that, and the Viking realm is known as Vale. Thank you very much, sir, for that fine song, that fine poem. And now, we're going to move on to our next storyteller. A storyteller we did not go very far to find because this storyteller works right here at Twisted Horn Meat and Cider. Yeah. Well, we started telling stories here some long time ago. Eric said, ooh, this is exciting. Can I get in on it? So now, not only is he an uh, employee here at the Twisted Army Insider, he's also now a member of the Storytellers of San Diego, the folks that are bringing you this tonight's presentation. So, Eric is going to tell us, well, we're here at a meat hall, so I believe it is only fitting that we uh, show honor and love of the great mead that we are all gathered here to celebrate and enjoy. But how come mead is so happy? How come it makes us so happy? What is it about mead that is so wonderful mead. and magical? Eric will tell you. <laughs> Eric Deardorff. Here you go. Yay! Thank you for that, Andrew. Were well, we doing the mic stand on this one? Oh, no, we can stand. I got one-handed gesture, so okay. it's fine. 
All right, yes, we are here live at the Twiskerhorn again for the first time in 16 months, was it? <sighs> Before the plague. So, it warms my heart to see glasses in hands and butts in seats once more, <laughs> as well as to be able to tell our lovely stories here at the Twiskerhorn. Yeah! And with this first story, this is the first storytelling since all of this went down, so the story I will tell you tonight is a story of many firsts. It is a story of the first war, a story of the first peace, and most importantly, is the story of the very first me, which has some relevance for poor Pavacier over there. But I'm getting ahead of the story. This is a story that goes back far, far back to just after the foundations of the world, when Yggdrasil was freshly rooted and all the nine realms had come into being. This is a story that involves both the Aesir and the Vanir, for in the old days there were two kinds of gods. The Aesir were those, Thor, Odin, Tyr, those we know of as great in courage and battle powers. And then the Vanir were the gods much older, gods of wood and earth and stone, gods of the mystic ways of wind and the sea. Of these gods, they lived relatively peacefully for a time, as there was plenty of realm in between their realms of Vanaheim and Asgard. But eventually, Someone from Vanheim came to Asgard. A sorceress came up the Rainbow Bridge and showed to the Asgardians her magical palace. For while the Asgardians could do much, the Vanir could twist the very warp and weave of fate. Now they could not change it. No man or god can change their fate as it is spun by the three norms at the roots of the World Tree Yggdrasil. Your destiny is wrote until the day you die. But the high magics could bend or tweak or twist this fate. Ask any spinner, pluck a single thread, you'll change the entire pattern. The Asgardians were amazed and marveled at these powers, and they began to clamor and grab at the ability to claim more glory, more honor, more treasure in battle. They began to fight amongst themselves over the sorceress's powers. And then a new thought began to take root in them. Perhaps this sorceress was purposefully leading them to infighting, leading them to turn against one another. So, in the most straightforward way possible, they decided to remove the problem. Thrice they pierced the sorceress through with spears. Thrice they bound her to a log. Thrice they burned her. And three times she came back angrier and more vengeful than before. A lesson, perhaps, about being careful who you decide to burn at stakes. <laughs> For this was no mere sorceress. No, this was Freya, one of the great goddesses of the Vanir and a warper of the weave of fate. When the Asgardians realized their mistake, they tried to argue they had not killed her, they had done her no lasting harm. But they had done her grave insult. And Freya's fury was like a glacier, slow, creeping, cold, yet always guaranteed of death. So Freya left Asgard and eventually returned with a whole host of the Vanir. They broke the wall that ringed Asgard, and in response the Asgardians took up their weapons to fight. Odin, sweeping up his spear, Gungnir, threw it out into the battlefield, claiming battle be joined. And this was the first war, the greatest war, the first battle that defined what war would be for all of the ages. It was terrible and it was bloody. For while the Asgardians were fierce in battle and strong in arm and had great weapons forged by dwarves, the Vanir had their sorcery that could turn the land and the water and the very heavens against the Asgardians. So neither side, despite their valor and powers, prevailed. Neither side could claim victory. But much blood was shed those days. Eventually, it was decided a truce had to be made. And so in the old ways, hostages were exchanged to preserve the peace and to make each group as brothers and sisters. To the Asgardians, the Vanir gave Freya, her brother Frey, and their father Njord, the god of the sea. To the Vanir, the Asgardians offered up Honir and Mimir, 
both knowledgeable, though Honier was a little bit more congenial, clever, and cunning. Oddly enough, only when Mimir was within whispering distance, though. And after a while, and after Honier had spent much time deferring and deflecting and saying, no, no, someone else should answer a question. No, no, someone else should tell a story. No, no, I couldn't possibly answer that question. The Vanir realized that they'd been given a dupe of a hostage. Honir was unfortunately not worth much of his weight. And it was Mimir who was constantly whispering wisdom and things to say in Honir's ear. Angered by this, the Vanir cut from Mimir his head and sent it back to Odin as a warning for this betrayal. Odin, for his part, did not wish to lose one of his great gods, one of his most trusted advisors. So he took the head of Mimir to the well that resides at the base of the roots of the tree Yggdrasil. He pickled the head in the well Erd, which is infused with magics. He spoke over its secret runes and powerful magics. And he gave life to Mimir's head once more, a head that could answer any question asked of it. The first question Odin asked was whether or not this offense should mean more war. Mimir counseled for peace. But how to find peace after such an incident? The gods Aesir and Vanir came together once more and agreed that since all had lost blood in this war, all should give of their essence to a common pool as a sign of good faith. A vessel was passed around, and each god put a little bit of spit, or perhaps a little bit of hair, or maybe just a little bit of a, <clears throat> a little bit of flesh, a little bit of their essence. A gesture which was repeated for as long as the old gods were worshipped in the Scandinavian lands. A gesture that meant good faith and friendship and a binding of all those present. Perhaps because this was the leavings of gods that something unusual happened. But from this bowl of conjoined essence of both the powerful Aesir and the wise Vanir sprang forth a god who was equal parts both. Kervasir. A god of great knowledge, storytelling, quick wit, and most beloved by all peoples who would wander the realm and tell people stories and bestow upon them knowledge. It is thanks to Gavasir that we have the knowledge of weaving the strong sails that we need to go to other lands. And we know which berries or ferns or leaves are safe to eat and which ones are less safe, depending upon how you make them. Gavasir gave to us all of this knowledge and he spread it amongst the Asgardians the Vanir. He spread it all through Midgard as well, since knowledge is something all people should share and revel in. Not all people wish to share knowledge, though. And this is the tragedy of Cavasir. For he knew much, and he gave freely of what he knew. But his life was the shortest of all the gods. Knowing all things as he did, perhaps he knew his ultimate fate. So when he was approached by two dwarves who asked him kindly to come with them to answer so freely questions as he did for everyone else, he accepted. He went to the dwarves' home, and there they opened the door and revealed a brewing kettle and two pots. One of the dwarves asked him directly, if you are so knowledgeable, Kvasir, you must know what these are for. Kvasir responded, the kettle is Odrarir, the great stirrer. The vessels are both and soon. And I pronounce you to Fjallar and Galar, deceiver and screamer. His words gave the dwarves pause for but a moment. But deceiver smiled at Kvasir, and screamer opened Kvasir's neck from ear to ear. Of his blood they saved it, for they knew this was his essence and the source of his knowledge. The dwarves strung Kvasir up and allowed his blood to drain into the vessel of Odin and Sun. They knew, though, that knowledge can be bitter, so they combined it with water and honey and put it into the great vessel Od Revere, where they stirred it over an open fire for many days and many nights. And from this, they made the first mead 
distilled from the essence of both the Aesir and the Vanir, pulled with knowledge from the blood of Kvasir himself, and given honey and water to make it not so bittersweet. The dwarves thought themselves quite cunning, as when Odin came looking for Kvasir, beloved by all, they tearfully presented the body of Kvasir, and sorrowfully told Odin, that poor Kvasir had choked on his knowledge, being caught underground in the dwarven halls with no one to share it with. And so the knowledge had simply burst out of his throat, which clearly explained the uh, hole in his neck. The gods took the body of Kvasir back to Asgard, for if Mimir could survive death, perhaps so could Kvasir. We still do not know, as Ragnarok has not yet come to pass when all things will end, begin anew, and perhaps even Kvasir will find his way back from death. So the dwarves kept Kvasir's blood. They kept the first need all to themselves and considered themselves quite cunning and quite vicious. They drank of it frequently and often, and each of these dwarves, normally so bereft of any passion or prose, could speak with the skills of the greatest scalds, sing great songs, and boast of all of their accomplishments like the murder of the giant Gilgal, another giant and another person they had wronged for nothing more than their own delight. They took this giant out on a fishing trip, claiming with their wise words that they knew the best place to hunt for whales, a Jotun favorite. Fjallar, of course, did the talking, whilst Gjallar tied a rope around the giant's belt and then around an anchor and then pushed it off the boat. The poor giant drowned. And then, for their own pleasure and satisfaction, drinking heavily of mead, they went to the wife of the giant and invited her out to see the spot where her poor husband had died, where she cried and wailed and wept at the base of the cliffs for days on end, until the dwarves grew tired of her wailing and dropped a stone upon her head. All of these things I tell you, so that way their ultimate punishment will feel like proper justice. For they boasted of these accomplishments wherever they could and whenever they drank. One should be careful if you boast of the open sky, and you should be extra careful if you boast near ravens. For those ravens might be Hunin and Yunin, thought and memory, the ravens of Odin. And so Odin learned of Kvasir's true death, and he learned of what had happened. And Odin, being the most cunning of all the gods, smart enough even to trick the trickster Loki on occasion, came up with a plan. And he put a thought out upon the wind, a thought to Sutum, the son of the murdered giants, a thought about where his parents might be found and what might have happened to them. Sutum, being a clever giant and versed as well in sorcery, went to the dwarves and asked to see the spot where his father had died fishing. The dwarves agreed, thinking perhaps they could add another great claim to their list of deeds through cunning treachery. But Sutung was smart enough to not trust a dwarf at his back. When they rode out to sea during the low tide, Sutung instead asked the dwarves to hop up onto a rocky tour to moor the boat so they could better set their lines. As the dwarves hopped off the boat, Sutung cut the line and rode back out to sea. The dwarves were left on a rocky pinnacle with nowhere to go, and the tide rising. The dwarves begged, pleaded, screamed for mercy. Please, we will give you anything. We will give you great gems or jewels. Sutung replied that he was already wealthy. What were gems and jewels as recompense for his parents' death? As the water rose up to the dwarves' waists, they begged and pleaded and screamed. Please, we will, we will give you our great dwarf in halls. We will show you our tunnels. We will give you the keys to our halls. Halls built for dwarves do not make good living for giants. So he refused again. And as the water crept up to their necks, the dwarves cried out, Please, no, we will give you a mead, a great glorious golden substance that turns even the most stone-tongued into skalds and poets. Please, we will give you our sacred mead. Sutung agreed, something as fabulous as that would be worth the dwarves' lives and fair recompense for the murder of his parents. So Sutung came to possess the mead made of Kvasir's blood, and he took it to his great mountain hall and held it there, safe and secure, sipping from it whenever he needed it. 
And this was all part of Odin's plan. Odin would eventually come to take the mead. But that is a story for another day. Uh -oh. <laughs> raise your glasses for Kvasir's blood. And raise your glasses for Kvasir, somehow back from the dead. Yeah! You did a really good job with that patch job on the throat, too. Here we go. Yes, you're welcome, everyone, for uh, the, the glory that is the magic of me. Skull. Skull! Skull! Wow. Okay, so Aunt Leanne is going to come up and share with us a story. She's always got something very interesting up her sleeve. She knows scary stories and fun stories and children's stories. And, and, and I think she's got something very interesting planned for us tonight. Aunt Leanne is our next storyteller. Please come on up, Aunt Leanne. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I'm going to get awfully close to the camera while I put all my things down. Otherwise, I'll have to juggle. Um, I do just want to note that this barrel's over here. When we give you all a, a break, you might want to walk by the barrel and drop things in as the storytellers. Um, appreciate your being here, we appreciate you being there, and we appreciate being appreciated. <laughs> so thank you very much. Um, after that story that Eric told, I feel I must have some need. But my story is in the North Catholic country, but not in Asengard. I'm going to put this mic aside for just a moment. Or not. No, not going to do it. All right, no drum for you. Long ago in the North Country, there was a widow who was raising her three children on the very edge of the country by the shore. She had a farm, and she would teach her children this song. My mother told me Someday I will buy galleys with good oar, sail to different shores. High on the prow I stand, a noble bark I steer, safely into the haven, too many bowmen. Too many bowmen. I bet you didn't know that she taught Assassin's Creed Game Maker that song, too. <laughs> but her children remembered that song, and as they grew, they would sing it whenever they would go on a journey or whenever they would be building anything. Now, the oldest son was tall and broad and blonde and ambitious just exactly what you think of when you think of a Viking. And the second child was also a son, not so tall and not so broad and very shrewd and always very well dressed. And the third child, ah, uh, well the third child was neither tall nor short, neither broad nor slender neither son nor daughter, neither shrewd nor ambitious. And they called that child Espinash. And Espinash would spend most of their time inside with their mother playing in the ashes. And of course, their two older brothers would tease Espinash. Oh, you are such a silly child. You are such a silly thing. You're neither this nor that. You should come outside and work with us and play with us. But their mother would gently encourage those two older children outside and take the younger one and console them. Espinash, you may not be the tallest, or the broadest, or the brightest, or the best dressed, or the cleanest, but I love you. And you are kind-hearted, and that's enough. And so the children grew up into adults. And one day, 
when those children had all grown and were helping their mother on the farm. The king, on the other side of the country, woke up and said, I want a boat. I don't want just any boat. I want a boat that goes as well on land as it does on the sea. And the king called all of his advisors and all of his engineers, and they got to work, and none of them could do it. And so the king got very frustrated and said, all right, all right, all right, uh, put the word out to everyone. And so the word was put out that the king really wanted a boat that would go as well on land as it would on sea, but no one could come up with anything. And so the king said, fine, I will give half of my kingdom and the princess's hand in marriage to anyone who can bring me a boat that goes as well on land as it does on sea. And the princess said, really? She was not happy at all. Well, it did bring quite a few would-be suitors to the kingdom, and they would try to build this boat, and the princess would go down and watch them and heap scorn upon their heads and laugh at them and needle them and just generally, overall, behave very badly, not just for a princess, but for anyone. But really, who could blame her? And soon, the suitors the would-be suitors said that it was worse to face the princess than it was to fail before the king. And fewer and fewer arrived. But the message continued to go out further and further and further in the country until at last it reached the very edge where the widow lived with her three children. And the oldest son said, Mother, I think I could do this. I bet I could build a boat that went as well as it, on land as it does on sea. All I need are the very best materials. Now their father had been a boat knight, and there were very fine materials stored in their barn. And so they gave the oldest child all of the good materials. And his mother said, and you'll need very fine provisions. And she packed the very best food. And they sent him off, and down he went down the road. My mother told me someday I would buy galleys with the whoa! Right there in front of him in the road was an old woman. Oh, she looked like she was in terrible shape. Every ounce of her body was shaking, and she looked so frail, and the sun thought, oh boy. I want to avoid her if I can. Just then, the old woman spoke to him and said, Son, son, where are you going, my child? And the first thing that popped out of his mouth was a lie. Um, uh, well, I'm going to the king to build a pigsty. Really? Well, as you say, so it shall be. And tell me, What's in that fragrant bag you have? And he looked at his provisions, and he said, Oh, well, um, this is slop for the pigs. Really? Well, as you say, so it shall be. And she stepped out of the way of his cart, and he continued down the road, and you know what? When he got to the kingdom, and he began to try to build a boat that went as well on land as it did on sea, all he could build were pigsties. And when he had built his third or fourth or fifteenth one, he thought, oh, boy, am I hungry. And he opened up his bag of provisions, and there, nothing but pig slop. And in disgrace, he went to the poorest section of town and began to build pigsties for the people there. Meanwhile, back at home, his younger brother had started to think, well, we would have heard by now if the oldest had built a boat that went as well on land as on sea. Mother, I think I could do this. And so she said, well, we don't have the best provisions. There are a few leftover things, and, and we don't have the best supplies to make the boat. Your father only left so much, and, but you may have the second best of each of those. And off he went down the road. 
very well dressed, as always. My mother told me someday I would die. <gasps> and there, right in front of him, was an old woman dressed all in rags and tatters that wavered while she shook. And her bent back was so low as she looked up and said to him, Oh, my child, my, my child, where are you going? And that shrewd boy, he thought, Oh, I bet this is a trick. This is someone who's been sent to find out my plans. And so he said to her, Oh, um, well, I am uh, going to the king to uh, build a, well, a garden shed. Really? Huh. As you say, so it shall be. And what is in that bag? Um, manure for the garden. Oh. Hmm. Well, as you say, so it shall be. And she stepped out of the way, and the boy went on, and I'm sure you know, when he got to that kingdom, all he could build were garden sheds. And boy, was he disappointed when he opened his lunch. <laughs> Meanwhile, back at home, the youngest child, Espinash, said, Mother, my brothers have been gone for a very long time, and I do have kind of an idea. I've been drawing it in the ashes, and I'd like to go and try to build a boat that goes as well on land as on sea. And their mother said, well, I only have one child left, and I kind of always thought you'd be with me forever. But if you would like to go, I will send you on your way. We barely have anything left to give you in the way of food, and there's not but a few scraps of wood left from your father's boat building days. But Espen Ash cheerfully took them on the back of their one donkey and went down the road. My mother told me, said, oh, there in front of him was an old woman. And she was shaking and dressed in rags. And she looked up at that child and said, oh, where are you going, my dear? And Espen Ash said, my mother has always taught me to be kind, and you look like you might be in trouble. Um, I am going to the king to build a boat that goes on land and sea, and uh, these, are, these are all I have for lunch, but you're welcome to share this crust of bread and the apple. Really? Well, as you say, so it shall be. And that old woman raised her hand and drew herself tall and with a snap of her fingers became that most powerful, magical creature of all, the wise woman. And she said, my dear, since you have been so generous and so kind, I am going to turn your donkey into a boat that goes as well on land as on sea. And again, she snapped her fingers, and so it was. <gasps> and Espen Ash was delighted. And then they said, oh, do, do you want to come along with me? And the woman laughed and said, no, no, no. But I will give you this ball of yarn that will take you anywhere you really need to go, and I will give you one warning. Anyone you meet along the way, you must take along with you in the boat. OK said Espinash, and off they went. And they really enjoyed steering that boat. It really went as well on land as they were sure it would go on sea. The wheels were smooth and turning along when all of a sudden, in Espinash's path, there was a man who was holding his belly and moaning everything that was anywhere around them into their mouth. Um, hello, 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 said 
said Espinash. Uh, who are you? Oh, I am always hungry. Oh, I just eat and eat and eat no matter what. I, I just have to eat. I'm always hungry. Well, said Espinash, um, you're welcome to come along with me if you'd like, and perhaps when we get to the kingdom, there'll be enough food for you to eat and not be hungry anymore. I doubt it, but I'd love to come. And always hungry, hopped onto the boat, and off they went. And it wasn't long before they were rolling down the road, and a woman was on the other side of the road. And she had, hmm, a tap that looked an awful lot like one of those along the silver wall stuck in her mouth. And she was... <laughs> and Espinash said, um, excuse me, what's going on with you? And she said, oh, I am always thirsty. I drank all the kegs in my entire village dry until the villagers kicked me out and I'm just trying to suck the last few drops of mead out of this tap. <laughs> oh, said Espinash. Well, we're going to the kingdom. Um, perhaps you'd like to come along, and maybe when we get there, there'll be enough for you to drink that you won't be thirsty anymore. What's your name? Always thirsty. And she hopped aboard the boat, and off they went. And they had not gone very far down the road when they noticed that someone was walking along beside them. And Espinach said, excuse me, sir, who are you? And after he finished ducking, he said, oh, <laughs> hi, uh, I am, can walk as far as I can see, can see for miles and miles, can hear for miles and miles, but I just have everybody call me. Miles. Oh, hello, Miles. Um, what are you up to? Well, even though I can hear and see and walk for miles, I get awfully tired. And I noticed you a long way off, and you've been taking on passengers, and I was wondering, could I come along? Of course. And Espinash invited Miles into the boat. And it wasn't long at all until they got to the kingdom. And when they got there, Everyone came out to see, for here was the boat the king had been asking for. But when the king and his daughter came down to look at the boat, the king liked that boat, but didn't like the look of the person who was sailing it. I don't think I can let you have half of my kingdom and my daughter's hand in marriage, you are neither tall nor short, neither broad nor thin, and I hate to take the obvious, but you're neither man nor woman, and I just am very uncomfortable with all of this. Oh, said Espinach. Then I guess you don't get the boat. Ah. Mm. I really do want the boat. What do you think, princess? Well, the princess looked at Espinach and said, um, I think you should give this person one more task. And the king said, ah, I knew I wasn't raising a dummy. <laughs> All right, let's give you one more task. Besides the boat, we'll have you, oh, go to the top of the farthest mountain that we can see from here on the balcony of the castle. And on that top of that mountain, I happen to know, there's a very rare flower. And if you can find that rare purple flower, and you can bring it back in, say, 12 hours, then the princess is yours, and you get half the kingdom. Hmm. All right, said Espinash. Uh, wait, wait, wait. That was a little too easy, said the king. Before you go, if there's going to be a big wedding, well, I, I think that you'd better... Uh, clear out all the storms below so that everybody can come to this wedding. Uh, there's one locker that's full of uh, well, enough food to feed the village in a siege for seven days. And um, then we have, of course, our wine, our beer, our meat, our cider that is all down in the uh, cellar that's enough to last for mm, three generations. And after you've done that, bring back the flour, all is well.
Well, I'm sure you know that Espinash immediately put Always Hungry into the room with all of the foodstuffs and put Always Thirsty into the cellar with all of those wonderful libations. And then Espinash talked to Miles and said, Miles, can you see, can you see the herb that's on the mountain? Piece of cake, said Miles. I'll be back long before your time runs out. And off Miles went, boom, 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 and as far as they knew, he was heading to the mountain. In the meantime, the princess was noticing that these rooms had been cleared. And she thought, huh, you have some pretty good friends, Espinash. You're not as dumb as you look. <laughs> and Espinash smiled and said, neither are you, princess. And they both laughed. But time was ticking along, and the king said, huh, it's been 10 hours, and your friend hasn't come back. So maybe you're not so smart. Maybe you don't have such good friends after all. And Espinash started to sweat. <sighs> Miles, can you hear me? And Miles who had fallen asleep after such a long walk, woke up and, and shouted back, finding that he had yet one more talent. He could be heard from miles and miles away. I'm here, but I've fallen asleep, and oh, I don't know if I can make it back in time. And that was when Espinash remembered that they had a ball of yarn. And they tossed that ball of yarn, and immediately they were brought right to where Miles had the herb, took that herb, rolled the ball of yarn back, and with two minutes to spare, handed it to the king. And the king took the flower and said, well, I don't know if I'm happy about this or not, but I really want that boat, so okay, you can have all of the kingdom if the princess will marry you. And the princess said, well, if you split it with me so that we rule 50-50, you're on. And Espinash said, done. And that is how it was, or wasn't, a long time ago in the land of the north. You want to sing with me? My mother told me someday I would buy galleys with good oars, sail to distant shore, high on a prow I stand, a noble bark I sail, safely into the harbor. Leanne, and thank you for reminding me. Yes, yes. Uh, not only should you tip the uh, wait staff and the folks who are serving you here tonight, we uh, also have a nice barrel here for to donate to the Storytellers of San Diego. We are a nonprofit organization, and uh, we are very grateful to have your uh, support. Uh, we will be back here again the third Thursday next month. Uh, doing more storytelling. October, guess what? Scary story time for October. Yes. All right. So uh, that reminds me. Okay, so we've got tips. We have got, oh, folks uh, online there, we've got folks in here from uh, Texas, folks from Florida. We, thank you so much for joining us, everybody, from all out there. Thank you, everybody, for coming out tonight in person to be here with storytelling. I really much appreciate it. Thank you very much, everybody. Skull to all of you. Skull! And so, uh, I think uh, I've got everything. Oh, Storytellers of San Diego. You want to follow us online at storytellersofsandiego.org. Uh, we have other events that will be coming up. There is a, uh, a story swap, which we're doing virtually. So you can come to our story swap and share a story, listen to stories. It's a great place for somebody who has never tried it before and would like to find out what it's all about in a nice, non-threatening atmosphere. The dates and times and Zoom information are on our website, storytellersofsandiego.org. 
I think we've got all of our uh, housekeeping done in an order. So for our last story, we're going to be bringing...